Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. Joining us today is Alan Gura, partner at Gura Pazeski and the lead attorney on two of the biggest Supreme Court cases in the past 10 years, District of Columbia versus Heller and McDonald versus City of Chicago. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Alan. Thank you so much for having me. So for those of us who, who don't know, uh, who aren't in the game of the Supreme Court game, District of Columbia versus Heller, what was that case? Well, for many years uh, since the beginning of the United States, the government was not really thought to have too many powers to regulate guns and we didn't have a whole lot of gun control. And consequently, we saw very few disputes arise under the Second Amendment, which guarantees people the right to keep and, and bear arms. Um, it was not until the uh, early 20th century, not until a case called United States versus Miller arose in the 1930s that the Supreme Court ever got a, a chance to directly comment upon the meaning of the Second Amendment. And in that case, the Supreme Court uh, issued a somewhat vague, uh, confusing opinion which had been misinterpreted for many years by people who wanted to believe that the Second Amendment actually secures no meaningful individual rights. It only secures some right to serve in a state militia or the right of the states to uh, provide firearms to, to those who might serve in, in an official military organization. Uh, that's not exactly what Miller said but nonetheless, this was the view of many courts who would routinely rubber stamp dismissals of uh, Second Amendment challenges by saying that there is no individual right to keep and bear arms, see U.S. versus Miller. This remained the practice until um, 2001 when the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the Fifth Circuit uh, in a case uh, out of Texas became the first federal appellate court to actually examine the Second Amendment, consider it, think about it. Uh, discuss it at some length and uh, that court concluded, not surprisingly, if you give it a real analysis, that the Second Amendment does in fact guarantee a meaningful individual right. Um, by that time, the Second Amendment issue had been uh, the subject of very intense academic interest. It was obviously a matter of great uh, interest to the American people and now we had a circuit split, a division of opinion among the federal appellate courts as to what this amendment means. Now, was it really was it really all circuits against the Fifth Circuit? Had they all decided that there was no individual? Right Most on the circuits second? had. Most circuits had, and th th there were two courts that were arguably open. Those were the the Second Circuit and also the D.C. Circuit out of Washington D.C. Let me ask real quick. You'd said that for quite a large chunk of the country's history, there the Supreme Court hadn't dealt with the Second Amendment much simply because the government wasn't restricting gun rights much. It just didn't – it wasn't an issue, a live issue. Um, how did it get to be one? What changed? Like why – was there a cultural shift? I mean you talked about that people were writing about this issue and there were laws popping up. When did that shift occur and why did that shift occur from the kind of more freewheeling earlier days? Well, it was not until the 1930s that the Supreme Court began to take an expansive view of the federal government's authority to enact regulations of, of all sorts. And so it was not until then really that, that we started seeing uh, sort of a license to the federal government to go ahead and explore in the area of gun control. In fact, the first uh, Federal Firearms Act, I believe, was enacted largely as a tax measure. There was some concern as to whether the Commerce Clause could even reach uh, a gun regulation. Uh, at the state level, there had been restrictions on guns, primarily uh, in the wake of the Civil War. There were many Jim Crow laws that prohibited uh, essentially African Americans and other people uh, who were disfavored in the South from accessing certain types of arms or from, from, uh, from carrying guns. But um, during those years, the prevailing doctrine to the Supreme Court was that the states were not bound to honor any of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was not considered to bind the, um, uh, the states and units of local government and so those laws were really not uh, subject to being addressed uh, in the federal courts. But most states had their own right to keep and bear arms in some way in their own constitutions, correct? And those were litigated and there had been cases in fact going back into the early part of the 19th century where state uh, Supreme Courts had struck down various 
gun laws and other weapons laws that dealt um, with the right to, to keep and bear arms under analogous state constitutional provisions. And so when the Supreme Court did finally uh, actually get a chance to uh, explore the Second Amendment, they did have a good basis uh, rooted in state constitutional doctrine that they could look to to see how the right to arms had actually functioned at least while the state courts were were dealing with it. And I assume that when you got involved with uh, D.C. versus Heller, you had been litigating gun cases for many years. No. No? <laughs> Nobody was really litigating too many Second Amendment cases. I, I sure wasn't. I mean I had a, a civil rights practice and uh, you know I was – uh, interested in taking cases that uh, challenge uh, ridiculous and unconstitutional governmental enactments, and and so that was what prompted me to to participate in the case. Uh, I did not, however, myself originate this this case or the idea for it. That came uh, from uh, Clark Neely and Steve Simpson, two attorneys uh, at the time at the Institute for Justice. Uh, Clark is still there. Uh, they saw the Emerson opinion come out, that Fifth Circuit case that had declared the Second Amendment to be. Uh, securing a meaningful individual right and they recognized that this circuit split now uh, posed a, a good opportunity but also a risk uh, for the Second Amendment to be finally uh, elucidated by the Supreme Court. It was an opportunity in a sense that um, finally there was a, a good chance to get this issue clarified. The court appeared to be probably as favorable as it uh, could be expected to be to hear this type of claim. But there was also a risk because most Second Amendment claims that had uh, arisen up to that point and generated bad case law were bad cases, typically arising in a criminal context where uh, some violent or irresponsible person was charged with committing a crime and they asserted a Second Amendment defense uh, you know, against the gun charges that, that they were um, – uh, that were leveled against them and of course that was very easy for courts to be dismissive of those claims and to sort of, you know not not take them very seriously the fear was that with a with a circuit split that the wrong case would go to the supreme court uh, and the united states supreme court would not really have the best presentation and the best platform in which to consider uh, this right, which of course is, is very near and dear to, to many, many millions of Americans. Then, what did Clark and Steve then do after they, they – so did they manufacture this case in some way with, str with strategic element in mind? Well, in a sense, yes. Not in a bad way but I mean in a strategic well, way. There's absolutely nothing wrong with strategic civil rights litigation. This is a storied American tradition. Uh, this, uh, you know, the NAACP, of course, uh, in the mid-20th century and early 20th century pioneered they really sort of were the first organization that really perfected uh, this idea that uh, people can bring about political change through the courts. After all, uh, the constitution guarantees us uh, a wide array of rights and when the political branches don't respect those rights, then it is absolutely appropriate and necessary to turn to the courts uh, to check the political branches and to enforce federal constitutional standards against recalcitrant government officials. And so there's, it's, it's considered to be uh, protected First Amendment activity for people to engage in this type of litigation and it's a, I think it's a noble cause. And Clark uh, and Steve uh, obviously are in, in that business and so uh, they took the idea to Bob Levy. Bob Levy at the time was a senior fellow in constitutional studies um, here at Cato. I believe he's now the chairman. He's now the chairman, yes. And uh, Bob was also on the board of the Institute for Justice where uh, Clark and Steve were working. And I believe that Bob had also co-clerked uh, clerked with Clark sorry, uh, in uh, federal court. So uh, they took the idea to Bob. Bob agreed that it's a wonderful uh, opportunity and it's worth doing and he agreed to fund it and organize it. And so um, along with another attorney, Gene Healy, who is now vice president here at Cato, started working on uh, the case. But they needed one more attorney to round out the team and so Bob contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in, in doing that. And I said, yes, it sounds like a good idea. I thought that the law was worth challenging. The strategy made sense and I was uh, very happy to be asked to be involved in that. Why bring this case in the District of Columbia as opposed to bringing it up in one of the states? Numerous reasons existed to bring the case in Washington, D.C. as opposed to somewhere else. First of all, Washington, D.C. had the craziest, most stringent and absurd law that we could imagine. It was a total prohibition on the possession of handguns and also a prohibition on the keeping of a functional firearm. That is, if you had a rifle or a shotgun that the city would allow you to have registered, 
You could never have it operable for the purpose of self-defense even in your own home. Oddly enough, they would let you use a gun for self-defense in a business but not in a home. Strange distinction. You mean like for security guards or things like that? Or? Uh, supposedly, supposedly. If you're defending your storefront, for example, but not your home. So in your home, you'd have to – as the person's breaking in, reassemble, reassemble gun. the gun yes. and load no, it? No, you can't. In the minute you could not reassemble the gun, it could not be functional. You could whack the intruder over the head with the gun. <laughs> you could throw the gun at them. But there was no provision for using the gun as a firearm for the purpose of self-defense. And in fact, the law was so stringent that you even needed a permit – to carry a handgun, supposedly, if you could have one, which of course you couldn't, uh, some handguns were grandfathered prior to 1977, uh, and those required a permit to carry inside your home. Never mind carrying a gun outside the home, which is a different issue. So those laws presented, we thought, a very radical and extreme platform, which to test the the concept of the Second Amendment. That is, if the right means anything, it must mean that those laws can't possibly be constitutional. But also Washington, D.C. is a federal enclave. It's a place where the Bill of Rights operates directly against the government. There is no need to consider the uh, very messy question, as we would later discover, um, of incorporation or application. How does the Bill of Rights apply uh, as against the states and localities through the 14th Amendment? It's a, it's, a different, uh, it's a different animal. Remember, when the Constitution was first ratified, it only bound the federal government. There was this belief that if your local government, if your state government um, violated your rights, you could simply vote them out. It was a government that was much closer to you than this faraway government in Washington. And who could imagine possibly the states violating people's civil rights? It was considered to be not too likely. That view obviously was perhaps a bit naive but nonetheless, that was the structure of our constitution until the Civil War. The Civil War, of course, um, took place and afterwards um, the 14th Amendment was ratified which bound the states to respect uh, people's federal uh, civil rights and it brought on uh, national civil rights standards. But we didn't have to worry about that in suing Washington, D.C. It's a federal enclave so we didn't have to ask questions about how – uh, the Second Amendment applied through the lens of the 14th Amendment, which is a very different and, and complicated issue. And finally, the, the third reason, of course, uh, aside from the fact that uh, you know, the law was crazy and it didn't have 14th Amendment issues in it, it was that the D.C. Circuit uh, was itself uh, open to the individual right. There wasn't really any adverse precedent at the circuit level that we had to contend with. So it was it was a perfect venue for all those reasons. I assume that the NRA was heavily involved in this case in some way. It would, it would stand to reason, I guess, because they're always involved in funding it or somehow involved in this case. Well, the NRA was involved in their complete opposition to the case. Uh, this obviously is an organization that has many members and the organization uh, cares about the Second Amendment, at least its, its views of the Second Amendment. But uh, when they uh, found out that this case was in the offing, they expressed their extreme displeasure and opposition to it being brought. Remember, the NRA is a group that uh, likes to engage in lobbying. This is considered to be their their forte. They uh, they go into the halls of Congress. They go into state legislatures. They feel that that's where they can operate. Judges, they have less faith in, or at least they had a lot less faith in at the time, and they were not sure that we would win. And of course, the consequences of our losing would have been. Uh, very bad. Nobody wanted to have a, a Supreme Court decision uh, or any kind of decision but certainly not a Supreme Court decision that declared the Second Amendment to be a collective right or, or a worthless right. Now, we were not oblivious to this concern. Obviously, we understood that there was risk involved. This was not something that we did lightly and it was not something that uh, we were uh, cavalier about. But we believed that the risk was in doing nothing because – uh, while we could uh, – in theory, we could promise the NRA that we wouldn't sue and the NRA could promise us that it wouldn't sue. There's really nothing that either of us could have done about all those other zany, crazy criminal people out there who make claims in court all the time. And in fact, there were other Second Amendment challenges uh, popping around uh, in the courts at the time that we brought this. There were some other cases that we had discovered were, were crawling around. And so we really felt that, look, you know, we can't guarantee a victory. That would be ridiculous. But we can guarantee that we would make a very good effort and a better effort than some of these criminals and some of these lunatics. 
uh, and we did that. And what did the NRA do? The, they, they had some strategies they tried to do to counter you guys. That's right. Well, the NRA filed a copycat case called Seegers versus Ashcroft um, and then tried to consolidate into our case. That is, they tried to, in a sense, uh, elbow their way into our case for the purpose of presenting um, a variety of non-constitutional arguments that the court could then decide the case narrowly and perhaps avoid – having to reach the, the constitutional issue and, of course, should the court reach the constitutional issue, uh, better for the NRA as, as far as it was concerned for it to be involved rather than these other interlocutors who, you know, who are these people? They're not us. It wasn't invented here and so uh, uh, you know, the NRA also saw that as a, as a competitive threat. I mean they do view it as a, as, a, as a threat to their branding interests when other people do things in the Second Amendment. And so we do see a lot of this turf-oriented activity from them and that still persists to this day. Maybe I'm being uncharitable but I'm wondering, was there any sense that they – the NRA might also have been motivated by a desire to protect its lobbying interests? I mean you can imagine if, if their bread and butter is lobbying Congress to get laws made that are friendlier to gun owners and the Supreme Court suddenly declares that gun owners are free and clear, then it might reduce the opportunities for lobbying and kind of reduce the importance of the NRA? I suppose that's possible, although I don't know that anybody was really thinking that all gun laws were, were going to go away just because there's a Second Amendment right. But I, I absolutely believe uh, that the NRA doesn't need or want what it perceives to be competition in the Second Amendment space. I mean, uh, this is a group that you know, if they could do it, they would hold a seance and give James Madison a life membership. I mean, they really think they own this, and they are very troubled by other people getting involved in what they perceive to be their turf. And and, and there is an awful lot of that coming out of that organization, um, and that's uh, that's too bad. But uh, in any event, the NRA was concerned that uh, that we would lose, uh, and they were concerned that they weren't involved. And so they got involved and they brought uh, arguments into the case that would have uh, – would, if they were – had been successful, would have averted a decision on the Second Amendment, which of course uh, would still not prevent us from a Second Amendment case in one of these uh, criminal matters from arising. Uh, we didn't share the strategy. We also didn't believe that those non-constitutional claims were very good. So. It's not just a matter that it wasn't in our interests strategically to avoid the constitutional issue. We also didn't really have much faith in some of those uh, non-Second Amendment arguments. And they also wanted a different attorney is from the story. Oh, sure. Heard. Yes. They, well, they had their own lawyers of course and, and they weren't uh, – But Stephen Hallbrook in particular I think was their chosen attorney who had yes. litigated Perez and, and is the gun guy and you were kind of an outsider coming in without much experience in this area. Sure. I mean and all of us, you know, none of us were – Neither I nor Clark uh, nor Bob uh, were affiliated with the NRA. We didn't have the NRA seal of approval, as it were, and um, that you know that's that's really where where the matter ended, as far as they were concerned. But they did bring uh, this other case. They chose, for whatever reason, compelled them to add another defendant to the case. They decided to sue John Ashcroft, the Attorney General of the United States. That was not necessary. Uh, John Ashcroft was not actually enforcing the home provisions of the, the D.C. Uh, gun laws, which were misdemeanors and therefore under the D.C. Courts Act or really the province of, of the district. But at least in theory, the NRA uh, theorized that Ashcroft had something to do with this and so they brought in the U.S. Department of Justice. Now, that sounds like a bad idea. It was a very bad idea. Uh, you typically don't want to bring in uh, defendants who are only going to contribute to your troubles. Sometimes you need to sue additional people and sometimes a case does go south if you don't sue everybody who needs to be sued. Uh, obviously, the case is not redressable then. But, uh, but no, uh, the, the Justice Department uh, brought uh, new and interesting theories to the case on, on standing and jurisdiction that the city had neglected to bring and probably would not have thought of and managed to knock out the NRA case as well as five of our six plaintiffs. Uh, but we did survive and, and move on. That was a pretty interesting element too because you need to – you had six plaintiffs including Tom Palmer right. uh, who is a, a fellow here um, and uh, with Atlas and Network. And has been a guest on the podcast. And has been a guest on the podcast and, and then they all got knocked out because they hadn't done the right motions. But at the end of the day, Dick Heller 
sort of remains as the as the plaintiff who satisfies all the standing motions, correct? Oh, that's right. Well, actually, people did do what was right. Remember, Washington, D.C., the D.C. Circuit has a unique rule on standing that's not followed in other parts of the United States. And in fact, the opinion that we received from the D.C. Circuit acknowledged that their decision on standing is contrary to what appears to be the rule laid down by the Supreme Court of the United States. Nonetheless, uh, the court advised they would follow their own path rather than that which one would imagine to be controlling from a higher court. That's an extraordinary statement uh, and the D.C. Circuit uh, standing doctrine is one that has come under fire repeatedly in many other cases, not just gun cases, but it's, it's a continuing source of – of controversy, but um, nonetheless, they followed that rule. Interestingly, the rule itself originated in an NRA case, a case called Navigar, uh, where the same attorneys, Stephen Halbrook and, and Richard Gardner, I believe, was involved, also had um, encountered difficulties. Encountered difficulties in suing the, the Department of Justice. Did you win at the D.C. Circuit? Then we did. It was that surprising. Um, I, I don't want to say it was entirely surprising, especially after the argument. The arguments uh, went fairly well for us. We we weren't um, – I don't think either result would have been surprising. I mean it's not a case where you, you would go into it and saying, well, we expect absolutely a particular outcome. So we were happy. Uh, but it, you know, I don't think we would have been surprised to lose. Uh, we weren't surprised to win. It was, it was uh, pleasant. I think by um, – it, it was a surprise relative to uh, you know, prior to starting the case. I think you know, back in 2003, if I would tell people that – I was handling a Second Amendment matter. They'd look at me like I was, you know, crazy. It was tinfoil stuff. It just simply was not. What about the Third Amendment? Yeah, exactly. Oh, I was going about the Third Amendment and uh, <laughs> cornering of soldiers matters. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. It's, it, it really was not seen as a respectable part of the Constitution. It was, it was old. It was dead and buried. It was a collective right. Nobody cared. It was. It was not considered to be a. Um, uh, a legitimate subject of litigation, which is why no one had done it really the way we had done it. I mean it's – if everyone thought it was a, a legitimate and, and wonderful thing to do, then it would have been done. And then you walk into the Supreme Court about a year after the D.C. Circuit opinion. That's right. Um, feeling confident would you say or – it was your first time at the Supreme Court. So that was – I'm sure that a little bit – a little bit nervous, but in terms of the substance of your argument, did you feel pretty confident? We felt confident that we had a great case. We felt confident that we were correct and we had done everything that could possibly be done to present it in the best possible way. And that's really all that you can do at the Supreme Court or really any other court. When you stand before that podium in front of the justices, that's the time to uh, tell them uh, what the Constitution requires and, and what, what the rules should be. And uh, if they agree with you, then then wonderful. And if they don't, that's obviously a, a, not such a good outcome. But nonetheless, that's the system we have. At the end of the day, somebody has to make these decisions and the Supreme Court is at the top of the decision-making uh, process in our system. And so um, to get that far, uh, to do a good job, submit the case uh, as best as can be submitted, that was our task and we felt pretty good about that. On a kind of general level, um, when you're – arguing in front of the Supreme Court, how much do the actual arguments you make to the justices matter compared to say the, you know, the, the briefs that you filed ahead of time that other people have filed and just the opinions of the, the justices that they already hold on these issues? I mean are these, are these cases won or lost in the oral arguments? Not really. I mean it's, it's easier to lose a case at oral argument than to win a case at oral argument, although both have been done. But the, the bottom line is, look, the Supreme Court and other courts as well, it's not just the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, courts read the papers. Uh, most of the argument is done uh, after a very long process of considered research and writing and drafting and submitting views that can be uh, researched, that can be read, that can be uh, the subject of memos going back and forth amongst the justices. It's not as though the court goes into the argument – uh, never having thought about anything and listening to 30 minutes of, of, of stuff from, from two lawyers slate, yeah. can, is going to go ahead and make a decision. Now, I know in our culture, we, we sort of venerate the legal process. Everything ends in a trial on TV. It's resolved in 44 minutes plus commercials and none of these lawyer shows or movies ever show um, you know, judges reading briefs or, or lawyers drafting discovery. I mean this – you know, the law is not usually as exciting as – you know the the dynamic courtroom scene 
you know, where Tom Cruise is yelling at Jack Nicholson. I mean, this is – that's not reality and it's not the way the Supreme Court works. I know that many people are disappointed with Supreme Court arguments because they expect somebody to get up and give some stem winder, some passionate Patrick Henry speech and that's just not the way it works. You're, su you're supposed to answer the justices' questions. They obviously have – concerns based upon what they've read in the brief. They're interested in elucidating the written material. But it's really the written material that forms the basis of your being there and it's the written material that you know, almost always is going to determine the, the outcome uh, in the case. So argument is exciting. It is interesting. It's the first chance that we get to perhaps see how the justices might be approaching the case, what types of issues they're, they're interested in, what did, what did they see in the case that, that they think is worthy of, of questioning. And so it's exciting for us. It, 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 it's often seen as a, like a preview of what the decision might be. But it's not as though the things that are said in that courtroom are often going to be the determinative factor as to the, the basic outcome, especially in a case like this where there's a very heavy-duty uh, constitutional issue. Trevor Well, that being said, uh, um, counsel, Justice Burris has a question for you. Okay. You come here to say that the Second Amendment conveys an individual right and I read the Second Amendment and it says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people, not a person, to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It could say it much clearer. What, what's with all the extra wordage there that seems to tie it to a militia? The Constitution could always be much clearer. I mean, I'm not so sure what commerce among the states means when the Congress has the power to regulate that activity. Does that mean the the ability of Virginia to sell a mule to New York? Commerce among the states? I don't know. Yeah. But uh, certainly, the Second Amendment has some uh, linguistic ambiguities as far as some people are concerned. And let's take a look at that. The first part of the Second Amendment tells you an opinion. It's the framers' opinion that a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. Now, that opinion could be wrong. It could be that the only thing you need for the security of a free state is uh, good diplomacy. Maybe Secretary Kerry does such a wonderful job or maybe you need a nuclear defensive umbrella or a large standing army. Who knows? But that's their opinion. And so they're telling you that because we hold this opinion about the militia, we are going to preserve the right to keep and bear arms. Notice the article, uh, the, 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 the right of the, the people. Yes. So they're referencing something that exists. It's a, it's, it's a concept that exists and in fact, it does exist at law prior to 1791. Uh, there was a right to bear arms in the Anglo-American legal tradition going back a very long ways prior to the Revolutionary War. It was, it was understood. It had a certain scope and the Supreme Court elucidated that. So it's the right which is preserved. And it's preserved because we value the militia. Now, what's the connection between the two? Well, the militia as it functioned in 1791 was dependent entirely upon – it was composed of ordinary civilians who were expected to show up for militia duty when the need arose, carrying, bearing their own privately uh, maintained weapons. If people didn't have the right to keep their arms – they could not function as militia, uh, as this militia which is so necessary to the security of a free state. It was believed that a, um, a malevolent government that wanted to prevent people's ability from acting as militia would disarm the people and thereby take that, act, that option away from them. So what the framers are telling us is, look, we really value the militia. That's a reason why we are codifying the right because you – if you, if you can't exercise the right, you can't be militia. But that doesn't mean that that's the only reason we're doing it and it sure doesn't mean that the right has no other application because the right obviously has other applications. But couldn't someone, couldn't someone argue on that, that very point that if the framers began this with an opinion, like we think that in order to have a free state, we need a militia, therefore the right to bear arms, that someone could turn around and say, look, we, we know from – a couple hundred years of experience that you don't actually need a militia to maintain a free state and so therefore the right to keep and bear arms is, is a non-starter and the framers would have agreed. No, because the, the fact is they have ratified this concept and we have to 
I mean, we have to obey by that decision. I mean, that they've ratified, even if they ratified it for a reason that, that now we no longer think is very good. I mean, we can we can erase the entire constitution on that thinking because the constitution has a preamble. The constitution tells us we, the people of the United States, why, why are we establishing the constitution? Well, to ensure domestic tranquility and all these other things. What if we determine that parts of this constitution don't actually serve those purposes? Can we uh, then discard? Uh, the Constitution to say, well, we don't really have domestic tranquility. We don't have – we haven't established justice. So let's get rid of the president. I mean we, you can't do that. Um, there's another preamble in the Constitution. Uh, in Article I, the Congress has the power to create intellectual property laws to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Uh, what if we determine that um, a system of copyright and patents doesn't promote the progress of science and the useful arts? Does that mean we can – you know the, the Congress's laws in this area are all invalid because we've made a policy choice that it's no longer a good idea to have these laws. Of course not. And likewise, if you publish a book that advances a sort of a radical back to nature anti science uh, mentality and you're anti progress and anti useful arts, that book would still have copyright protection available to it when it's created. Uh, so again, we don't we don't have purposes preamble of purposes. Uh, control the continuing existence of, 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 the, of the operative text. But at the very least, doesn't it seem that if we are going to use the, this militia term, which doesn't really exist anymore, and we're talking about something written in 1791, so at the very least, that are they only talking about muskets and single, uh, single loading musket balls you load from the, from the muzzle? Does this actually apply to automatic weapons and flamethrowers and tanks and grenade launchers and rocket launchers? I mean, they weren't even thinking about that. So it doesn't even make sense to, to read it in context of history rather than the present? Well, the, uh, first of all, the constitution is not uh, frozen in amber in terms of technology, right? I mean the Air Force is not unconstitutional just because there were no airplanes, right? Congress had the power to, to, to raise an army. Uh, they didn't have any, any airplanes but that doesn't mean the Air Force is, is unconstitutional. Maybe it is. No, okay. I'll um, entertain the thought. <laughs> and then the First Amendment guarantees you the freedom to worship the religion of your choice or no religion. But that doesn't mean that you can only worship those religions that were in existence in 1791, right? You can be a Mormon or a Rastafarian or other things that weren't here in the United States uh, back in the day. Uh, likewise, you're right against search and seizure. You have uh, certain uh, spheres of autonomy in your person and your possession in your home. That um, cell phones. That's yeah. right. Cell phones. There were no cell phones, and 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 the Supreme Court has held in various contexts that your Fourth Amendment rights still apply. For example, wiretaps, cell phones. Uh, can the government uh, bring a, um, uh, a heat? Seeking a device to see if you have growing lamps inside your house without a warrant. No, it can't. Uh, and so, likewise, the Second Amendment is not going to be limited to those articles that existed literally at the, at the time of 1791. Uh, however, uh, it doesn't mean that every single thing that goes boom is going to be constitutionally protected. There are going to be some limiting principles that are inherent in the right and in in its its scope as that was understood. And so um, in Heller, we had a law dealing with a handgun ban, right? So we had to ask whether or not handguns were arms and if so, which they are, uh, are they protected arms? Because not every arm is going to be protected. We see this in the speech area. Um, speech is protected but not perjury, uh, not terroristic threats, right? Uh, and likewise, there might be some arms that are not protected. And so what are, what's going to be the limiting principle? And the Supreme Court – gave us what's come to be known as the common use test, right? Um, handguns, we were told by the city and all of its allies, are unaccountably dangerous. They are used very frequently in crime. They're involved in accidents. There's all kinds of mayhem and social cost associated with handguns uh, and probably more so than with any other type of, of, of arm. Definitely more so than so-called assault rifles, for example. Yeah, right? there's about six thousand two hundred handgun deaths per year, and about yeah. three hundred and forty, about a hundred assault rifle any deaths rifle. per year. Yeah. Any rifle, any rifle, three hundred and forty for any rifle. But but the court said it's not important. It doesn't matter that handguns are misused by criminals. What matters is handguns have a common traditional application by law-abiding, responsible people uh, for traditional. Uh, uh, acceptable purposes, including primarily self-defense, which is the interest at the core of the traditional right to keep and bear arms. And so whatever else happens with handguns, people expect, have an expectation of having handguns available to them for the purpose of self-defense. And so the government cannot ban them 
uh, completely. However else it might want to regulate them, you cannot ban handguns. And that's the test that, that, that should be used by courts going forward in examining challenges to other weapons laws where there's a categorical ban on a weapon or on uh, some part of weapon like a, like an ammunition magazine, for example. Yeah, like a 30-round magazine or something yeah, like that. The, the, the correct approach is to ask, what does this do and is this how people would expect to use it? So if you have a rifle, even if it's a very scary-looking rifle, it looks like a military weapon, uh, it holds however many rounds. If this is something that people would have the expectation of having available to them in common use for a traditional lawful purpose, then that item cannot be prohibited by the government. Uh, and that's a very useful test. It doesn't protect everything out there. I'm sure there are people out there that want all kinds of stuff that's probably not going to qualify. But it's, a, it's as expansive a test as we can get to protect our rights. Now, lower courts don't always honor this test. There are courts that are having trouble following it. Uh, they will say, well, OK, the rifle is protected. It's, it's, it's um, the subject of the Second Amendment because it's in common use, but we can still ban it because there's some other reason. That but part is not acceptable in Heller and I hope and expect that we would see a future case coming to the Supreme Court that would deal with that. So this test, this common use test that the Supreme Court gave us looks like it's – backwards looking. So it's, it looks to do people ha already have an expectation of being able to use this thing in these legitimate ways and if yes, then you can't ban it. But how would that apply to – I mean we talked about – as Trevor brought up, one of the issues that people raised with the Second Amendment is the the framers when they wrote it had these single shot muskets and other you know, very low tech weapons um, and then things have changed and people say you know, they never had assault rifles or automatic weapons in mind. Presumably, technology will keep improving. Does this test – this test would seem to preclude the right to own new things because by definition, these new things can't have a culture of acceptance because they haven't been around. I don't believe that that's the case. Um, for example, there, have, there has been at least one court so far that I'm aware of which has extended Second Amendment protection to stun guns, uh, taser-type weapons. The way to look at it is to see that it's it's what your expectation might be given the weapon's function. So, um, for example, if something new were to be invented, I don't know some type of ray gun, suppose, okay, but it functioned much as a traditional farm does, and it had that same application and size, then we would look to um, uh, to that and to determine whether or not it's, it's protected. In this way, it's actually analogous to the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, of course, guarantees. You um, uh, certain spheres of privacy. The, the question is whether you have an objectively reasonable expectation of, of privacy in some location or thing or, or, or behavior. Uh, and in the 1920s, the Supreme Court held that the Fourth Amendment did not cover wiretaps. In the 1960s, it changed its mind. And the answer in the 1960s in the Katz case was not, well, the uh, defendant should have gone to law school and he would have studied our prior cases, he would have known there was no expectation of privacy and therefore he's out of luck. Rather, the court looked to tradi traditional American expectations as to how this right would function or should function, where people should have respected uh, a sphere of, of privacy and it was able to overturn its, its precedent. And the Second Amendment should, should function the same way. But the other question the, on the other side of this, not just future weapons. But maybe the, one of the reasons that automatic weapons are not in common use begins with the National Firearms Act of 1934, the subsequent bans in 1968 and 1986. So now they're very uncommon but by way of the government. So does that mean that we should maybe challenge the automatic weapons ban? I would not challenge the automatic weapons ban for various reasons. But I, I don't believe that the, uh, the literal number of these firearms out there is necessarily going to supply the answer. The, obviously, the, uh, the plaintiffs in such a case would say exactly what you've just said. Well, the government taxed it very heavily at its infancy. Uh, there's been a limit since 1986 on the number of uh, machine guns, for example, that can go on to the, the, the registry. And so there, we've had these artificial constraints placed upon their numbers and that's why they're not common. The government would respond by saying, no, those things may have limited their acceptance in society, obviously, the tax and the, the subsequent limitation. But the real – 
reason why they're not in common use or they would not be in common use is the better question. Would they be in common use? Is because there is no machine gun season for deer, because you would not use a machine gun to defend yourself against a rapist or a mugger in a parking garage, that these are not – the government would say that these are not arms that have a, uh, a, a, a proper lawful traditional application uh, given their function. And I believe that the government would probably uh, prevail on those views. Uh, I personally um, uh, think that uh, we're, we're, we're at a point now where it's hard to get courts. There's a lot of resistance to the Second Amendment. Okay, It is tough to, to win these cases. There are, there are cases where we have enough trouble gaining uh, protection for ordinary semi-automatic rifles and handguns uh, for magazines that contain 11 rounds, which is not a big deal. And uh, given how high the, the hurdle is in practice, even if it's not something the Supreme Court would have imposed on us, but th there are serious practical difficulties in attaining protection for these items. To go in there with machine guns and things that are at the very edge is simply not smart litigation. I don't believe that those cases have a chance and I, I don't think that it's wise to bring them. Since this decision came down, has, have residents of the District of Columbia – now been able to reasonably freely get handguns and own handguns? More or less. DC laws have improved. What we've seen, of course, uh, is the city reacted with a very restrictive registration process, which over the years here and there, they've relaxed in certain ways. It is still too difficult to acquire handguns in Washington, DC, but it's very far from impossible and there are many people who have handguns in D.C. And maybe it's just the nature of a place like Washington, D.C. where everything is going to be hyper-regulated. I mean this is not going to be the Wild West in terms of anything, let alone guns. Uh, so perhaps people should adjust their expectations accordingly regardless of the, f of the fact that it's guns that are at issue. Uh, nonetheless, no, we do have many people in Washington, D.C. now who have handguns, who have functional farms in the home and we get more every day and we're doing what we can to try to improve people's access and to keep fighting for greater freedom with those firearms. And have we seen the predicted awful results that many envisioned um, when suddenly more people have handguns? We're going to have a lot more deaths, a lot more crime, a lot more kids accidentally getting shot. No. And in fact, not only have we generally not seen an explosion of of a crime or gun crime, I don't believe that we've seen a whole lot of crime committed with with those handguns that are owned by the uh, law-abiding, responsible people who, in fact, have gone ahead and complied with all of DC's laws and and uh, registered those firearms and, and had those licensed. Now we have not seen any uh, meaningful crime, if at all, from those guns. Now, outside of DC, though, uh, to the day that the Heller decision came down, I think it was the same day, you filed another lawsuit and you were evident – you didn't write it that morning. You were planning on this. I assume you had the complaint ready. Uh, it, what was that lawsuit and what was the strategy behind that? Sure. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the Second Amendment only applies directly to the federal government. It does not bind the states directly. For that, we had to fight the Civil War and we had to have the 14th Amendment ratified. The 14th Amendment provides – that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. And by that, everybody understood uh, meant that um, your Bill of Rights rights as well as some others are uh, not to be violated by state officials and we know why that was enacted in the period of Reconstruction. Uh, nonetheless, it's not automatic. The way that, that the law has developed over the years, the Supreme Court has rather than – incorporated wholesale the Bill of Rights through the 14th Amendment has gone sort of a la carte, uh, piece by piece, uh, saying – Clause by clause. Clause by clause. This one we like. Uh, this one is OK now. This one we don't. Most of them – some of them have not been incorporated but most of them had been incorporated by the time the Heller decision had come out. But the last word on the Second Amendment from the 1870s was that it was not uh, incorporated uh, against the um, – as against the states through the 14th Amendment. Now, that decision also said the First Amendment did not apply to the states and that part of it had long since been, of course, overruled. But, but there was nothing fresh on the books about the Second Amendment and we knew that uh, it's great to get rid of 
uh, crazy laws in D.C. and it's nice to restrict the powers of the federal government. But most people, uh, they interact with, with state authorities and most gun laws exist at the state and local level. And so for the Second Amendment to have any sort of meaningful application for uh, modern life in America, it really does need to apply to states and local officials just like uh, every other right. And so we filed a lawsuit called McDonald versus City of Chicago challenging Chicago's law, uh, which was virtually identical to D.C.'s in terms of the handgun ban. And both cities were so safe and peaceful. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah. Islands of tranquility yeah. in, in a storm of, of mayhem. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we, we did sue Chicago immediately. And the, the objective there obviously was to, to bring Second Amendment freedoms to, uh, to people as against their, their immediate local officials. And you find yourself back at the Supreme Court with that case within Correct. two, two years. years. That's right. Yeah. Where that case moved very quickly. And then you walked back into the, the courtroom and this time the argument was not ostensibly about guns because that was supposedly decided. We had decided five to four that you had an individual right to keep and bear arms. This was just about whether or not it applied to the states. And this time the question was about how are we going to apply it to the states more or less. How did that argument sort of shake out and how, how did the case shake out in general? Well, it was a fascinating case in many ways because it really brought together strange alliances and, and really discombobulated a great many people on issues that had nothing to do with firearms. It, it, as you mentioned, it really was not a gun case so much as a, as a civil rights case, a general case about you know, how people relate to their state and local officials uh, generally with, the, with respect to their individual rights. When the 14th Amendment was ratified, everyone understood that the, the first part of it, section one, of the 14th Amendment, the one that says that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States meant your basic rights including the Bill of Rights. And that was controversial. It was very controversial. The South sure didn't like it. It was, it was extremely difficult uh, to, get, uh, uh, to get through but they obviously ratified it. Um, and almost immediately, the first case uh, in the Supreme Court to deal with the meaning of the 14th Amendment, a case called the Slaughterhouse Cases arising out of a monopoly in Louisiana on the slaughtering business in New Orleans, uh, eviscerated the clause. The, uh, five to four, a majority held that the rights, the privileges or immunities that are protected by the 14th Amendment uh, are only those that flow out of the existence of the government itself. Now, what does that mean? It means you have the right to a passport. It means you have the right to the protection of the Navy on the high seas. It means you have the right to visit the Treasury uh, and take a tour of, I guess, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. It's real bread and butter stuff. All the stuff, we fought yeah. this, all the stuff we fought the Civil War over, right? I mean, uh, as, as uh, one law professor had once said, you know, Arkansas was not sinking people on the high seas. That's not why we fought the Civil War. Everybody knew what the Civil War was about. But we had a Supreme Court that was absolutely not interested in uh, continuing with Reconstruction. Uh, by that time, it was it was uh, you know the American people, some of them at least, were, were tired of the matter, and so this very creative, um, very narrow view took hold that the only rights that you had available to you under the Fourteenth Amendment were these basically worthless, bizarre uh, rights that no one had thought of, but the the pre existing rights that you had, your right to speak, to worship, to have guns, all those things which were. Uh, essentially natural rights, uh, as it were, that are protected by the Constitution. They're not created by the Constitution. They're simply secured, right? Remember, it says the right of the people shall not be infringed. Uh, you know, it doesn't say we are now creating a right. No, it says there's a pre-existing right and you shouldn't infringe it. Those pre-existing rights, not protected. And so we embarked upon a very sad period of history in the United States where uh, states were free of having to trouble themselves about whether they were violating the Bill of Rights, not just the Second Amendment but all of it. Now, uh, over time, the Supreme Court came to reconsider and so they developed a, a doctrine which was uh, called selective incorporation. They looked at the due process clause, the clause that says uh, that no state shall uh, deprive people of life, liberty or, or property without due process of law and determined that that has a substantive element to it such that um, – uh, if if the state is violating some some right, it's depriving you of, of the due process of law. The law itself cannot be truly law because it's violating some some basic principle. But not every right gets 
incorporated through this process, only those rights that the court thinks are really important or worthy of, of consideration if they are what the court said implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. Uh, that was the, uh, the ultimate uh, formulation. And um, so we uh, made both arguments in, in McDonald and there's a reason They're why. Both we, being the, yes. the, the due process clause and the privileges That's right. or immunities clause. That's right. The due process clause argument was the argument that was very well established. Every justice, every judge has strong feelings about it one way or the other. It's, it remains controversial but it is part of the, the mainstream of American law. Um, uh, you obviously have to argue that and we did because that's the primary tool for incorporating. But we also knew something else, a couple of other things. First of all, the slaughterhouse cases were wrongly decided. It was one of the most outrageous decisions to ever come out of the Supreme Court of the United States and it's one that we had an independent interest in in challenging. And also a vast majority of scholars of the 14th Amendment agree now yes. that, that the slaughterhouse cases is, were wrongly decided. It is, it is absolutely understood by everybody that that you – know, there used to be a strain of thought that, that, that tried to defend slaughterhouse. That's been largely debunked. The scholarship on that is very well established and it's simply not a controversial position anymore that slaughterhouse was, was wrongly decided. It's considered to be a disaster. Um, we knew that also there are some justices on the Supreme Court who are open to the slaughterhouse cases being revisited. Justice Thomas had written that very explicitly. There, were, there had always been justices here and there over the years who volunteered their opposition to slaughterhouse. We've never had five of them at one time on the Supreme Court but we've had many of them. So we knew that people who – uh, are called justice and show up at the Supreme Court for work might believe in this. Okay, so it's important to preserve it. We also see the due process theory is very controversial among particularly the the more conservative uh, right wing justices, as it were. Um, Justice Scalia, for example, has been just you know, completely opposed to this idea that you can have something like substantive due process. He's used very uh, interesting language to 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 decry it. We had no way of knowing that we would have five votes on either theory but we felt that by preserving both arguments, we could add up to five uh, and so it was necessary to preserve both claims, not just because it's the right thing to do but also because we'd like to count to five because that's what you need to do to win the Supreme Court. We also wanted to get the support from the more left-wing uh, progressive people who don't much care for guns but who nonetheless um, – want to get rid of the slaughterhouse cases for their purposes. They are very interested in establishing that the incorporation of civil rights through the 14th Amendment is not just something that a bunch of hippies made up in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It actually does have real roots in text and tradition and, and in the original history of, of the 14th Amendment. And so for all those reasons, uh, we, we preserved uh, both claims and in the end, uh, we were vindicated because the, um, the, the court fractured. It was a 4-1-4 decision. There were five votes against due process incorporation. The four uh, so-called progressive justices plus Justice Thomas who absolutely refused to go along with it. And there were four votes um, for only due process incorporation but some conservatives are squeamish about revisiting the Privileges and Immunities Clause. And so they, um, they only went with due process and Justice Thomas only went with, with privileges or immunities. And so that did provide in fact the winning vote. And if, had we not done that, we would have lost, which is what happens to you at the Supreme Court if you don't preserve your arguments. And that's happened before. Uh, the most obvious recent case, of course, the, uh, the partial birth abortion case where five to four, the Supreme Court ruled uh, against the challengers to the partial birth uh, abortion ban but there was a concurrence by Justices Scalia and Thomas who said, hey, you know, we don't much care for abortion rights. We don't believe there's such a thing but nobody had argued to us that Congress lacks the power under the Commerce Clause to regulate abortion. It's a health care decision. We're not so sure Congress can regulate health care. Um, uh, perhaps that argument had been made, you know, maybe it would have been a different result. Uh, that case could have been 6-3 the other way instead of 5-4 against the challengers and we didn't want to be in that situation. So we preserved both claims. It was the right thing to do and of course it proved to be what, what saved the case. So now that the Second Amendment has been incorporated 
against the states, what issues are left for the Second Amendment? Are you working on any cases right now? Yes. Many, many cases uh, are winding their way through the courts. I'm working on, on many of them. There are many issues to be determined. Who can have guns? Under what circumstances? Can you carry a gun? Where? Under what circumstances? What type of guns uh, are OK under the Second Amendment? What, I mean there's so many regulations in deal, dealing with firearms and so many Second Amendment challenges to those regulations. It has indeed become a vast new area of, of litigation. Well, we're really, yeah, we're really looking at a, a nascent right here, right? Absolutely. We, we have not to define – we took a century to define the First Amendment plus. So. We're not done with yeah. the First Amendment. Or the, I can guarantee you – I don't know what the cases are going to be, but I know that five years from now, there's going to be a First Amendment case at the Supreme Court. There might be a Fourth Amendment well, of case. Course. Of course. You yes. know, and you know, these things, you know, as American society develops over time, the government always thinks of strange new ways to infringe on people's rights and, and people go to the courts uh, or different questions arise. And likewise with the Second Amendment. I mean there are so many – uh, questions that have not yet been answered just based on the things that have already been around uh, for some time. So who knows what the future might hold. But no, there is a lot of litigation going on and um, it's a very exciting field. Do you think that the next case, one of the issues is concealed carry, for example, just to give a flavor of the kind of issues, um, may issue and shall issue states. Uh, there's, a, there's a controversy there. So what are those types of concealed carry regimes and what's wrong with uh, shell issue? Sure. The Supreme Court has not been eager to take too many Second Amendment cases since McDonald. In fact, it's not taken any. But the case that came closest, and that that is, it was considered at three different conferences before uh, cert was denied, was a case I had called Drake versus Dredging, which brought about that very question about what what do you do about permitting systems that provide that only special people who are approved by the government get to exercise uh, this this particular right. Um, there is an emerging circuit split on that question. It's one that I believe the court is going to jump into and there are several cases now uh, popping up. Um, a, as of right now, uh, two in California uh, are, are before the Ninth Circuit uh, considering whether to hear them uh, en banc, Richards versus Yolo, which is my case and also Peruta versus San Diego are both – as of this – today as we sit here, uh, pending an en banc vote. There are a number of cases coming out of Washington, D.C. Tom Palmer's case uh, is uh, is there. So I think those cases could, could bring that uh, back to the Supreme Court. Generally speaking, um, people cannot be required to prove that they deserve to exercise their constitutional right. Give me an example of what kind of – thing these shell issue states require of you? What do they say? I mean, the May issue states. The, yeah, yeah, the May issue states, sorry. Well, you know, in, in New Jersey, the state says you need a justifiable need to exercise. Determined by? By the police. The police determine Just whether. Bob, Officer Bob decides if I get a justifiable need. He fell out the form and it was uh, some official in the state police makes that determination. In Maryland, it's a good and substantial reason. I mean, could you imagine if, if we had a, a law that said, well, you need a good and substantial reason to speak or to worship or, hey, how about to have an abortion, right? I mean, Arizona tried this. You needed a medical uh, necessity. Right to have an abortion at a certain stage, and the Ninth Circuit made quick work of that just a couple of years ago. In Isaacson v. Horn, no, it's not the right of the doctor to decide; it's the right of the woman in that case to decide whether to have the the procedure, which is established as of right uh, under the Supreme Court precedent. And so the idea that well, you have a right to do something, but we think it's such a bad idea that you don't actually get to do it unless you have a rare, really compelling reason to do so is just completely foreign to the very concept of rights. It just doesn't make any sense at all. If you have the right to do something, then you have the right to do it. Now, it doesn't mean that it can't be regulated. There, there are going to be time, place and manner restrictions. The court has already said that. There are going to be dangerous people who can be disarmed. Obviously, if somebody wants to carry a gun but they're a serial killer you know, or some super heavy drug dealer, the the government can take away their guns. That's not really a controversial point. But that doesn't mean that law-abiding responsible people don't enjoy this uh, ability to, to exercise a right. Uh, and so we'll see that uh, determined I think very soon. So looking forward over the next couple few decades, are you optimistic about the direction we're going with Second Amendment rights? I'm optimistic. Um, in a limited sense, there, there is a great deal of resistance by the courts. There are 
uh, judges who don't seem to care much for the Second Amendment and there are those who may not care one way or another but they treat it like a serious, meaningful right. And so of course we're not going to win every case. I understand that. Uh, nobody is perfectly happy with all First Amendment law. Nobody is perfectly happy with all Fourth Amendment law and nobody is going to be perfectly happy with all Second Amendment law. However, we, we, we should be a little bit concerned about uh, the future in terms of uh, who is going to be making these decisions? Okay, judicial nominations do matter. Uh, we have large segments of American society where nobody has a gun, nobody would admit to having a gun, where guns are seen as foreign and scary and strange, and people who come out of uh, perhaps uh, that type of a background uh, who don't see much utility in firearms. Uh, to that uh, mindset, every regulation looks appropriate, right? If you place no value on the activity because you can't relate to it, then um, everything looks reasonable in terms of what a restriction might be. And I think this is the, lar the larger cultural problem that we have in the gun debate is that, is that we have um, almost two segments of the country and one of them understands firearms, appreciates them, sees some value in them and is therefore – able to to consider them as, as an object of constitutional protection and just a part of society that, that simply um, has a hard time comprehending that there's value in it. And, and when judges flow out of both of those groups onto the bench, you see the, the differences of opinions that manifest themselves. And, and it, I'm not sure what the solution to that is, uh, but it's something that uh, that's always going to keep the debate lively. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, you can find us on Twitter at FreeThoughtsPod. That's FreeThoughtsPod. FreeThoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more, you can find us on the web at www.Libertarianism.org.